Welcome everyone. Uh, thanks to come today to this new webinar that is organized by INDAST. We will wait one minute more because I can see that the number of attendees is growing very fast. Now we are 44, no 42, sorry. And uh, there were like around 90 registrations today. I have to say that thanks a lot for your uh, participation because it was quite unexpected that this webinar was so successful. Then, yeah, we will wait just a few seconds more. And uh, meanwhile, I will take the advantage to say hello to everyone and good afternoon. And uh, as you may know, this uh, series of webinars is run nice through the INDAS that I'm not sure if most of you know about INDAS, but it's a course of action that tries to create a network of people from different communities, researchers and service providers, but also users around the topic of dust and its impacts. Then this series of webinars are focusing every week, every two weeks, in a different topic. And uh, Estelios will introduce the, the, the webinar of today. Estelios is one of the core group members of this cost action. And some logistics for the, for the, during some logistics that you have to take account during the webinar is that you have the menu, the panel with the menus. And there is a question box that you can use in any moment of the session. And you can type and write there any question that you want to uh, ask to me. And Estelios and me we will ask uh, after the, the talk. And also there is a chat box that you can also use. We will be taking care of all the things that you will write in these boxes. And uh, I think that this is all from my side. Then I will pass the ball to Estelia Casatzis, that, as I said, is the one of the core group members of in Task of Action and the leader of these dissemination activities. Then the floor is yours, Estelia. Okay. Uh, thank you very much, Sarah. Uh, hello, everybody. Uh, we have the pleasure today to have uh, the talk of Nick Middleton. Uh, Nick Middleton is a physical geographer based in, at uh, St. Anne's College in the University of Oxford in the United Kingdom. His main research interest is in the nature of human use of drylands. So he has a number of publications in this area, including the advancement of, in the drylands, desert dust in the global system, and the world atlas of desertification. Uh, he has worked uh, with several United Nations bodies on dryland issues, including the United Nations Environmental Programme, who commissioned the report that uh, you're going to hear about today, an overview of this, on how sand and dust storms impact the oceans. So, Nick, thank you very much for having this uh, opportunity to listen to you, and uh, you have the floor for your presentation. Thank you very much, uh, Stelios, and I trust everyone can see my screen. So, um, greetings, everyone. I'm going to give you the, the bare bones and findings of this uh, report that I authored for the UN Environment Programme, UNEP, on the impacts of sand and dust storms on oceans. And the brief was to uh, uh, produce a review and synthesis of these impacts um, with a view to um, making some recommendations for policy makers. Uh, although I was the sole author, uh, it was a, a collaborative um, effort because the uh, text was reviewed by many more reviewers than I've ever had to deal with before, at least 20, um, uh, many of whom are also connected to Indust. Uh, the report was supposed to be originally published and uh, launched at a, a big UN Oceans Conference in June last year in Lisbon, um, which fell uh, uh, to the COVID pandemic. Uh, and it was eventually published um, in November last year, I think. Um, fine. So um, what I'm going to be talking to you about today 
can be broadly broken down into uh, two categories, dust and biodiversity in the oceans. And I'll talk a bit about ocean primary production, dust and algal blooms, uh, microbial pathogens, both in, in the uh, uh, seawater and carried in desert dust, dust and coral reef systems. And then the second major um, topic area uh, is around dust and global climate via the impacts on the oceans. Uh, so it's largely to do with the biological carbon pump uh, and the sequestration of carbon in that way and both contemporary era and also over the quaternary glacial and interglacial cycles. Um, why are the UN in, interested in, in dust? Well, um, several reasons. Um, uh, sand and dust storms have significant implications for a number of the sustainable development goals, uh, particularly SDG 14 on life below water, obviously, but also SDG uh, 15 on life and land. And this topic demonstrates the interdependencies between the sustainable development goals and also the interdependencies between land and the oceans. And in governance terms, um, there aren't many governance mechanisms that uh, bridge that gap. The UN in general terms have been interested in sand and dust storms for ooh, five or six years now. There's been a, a resolution each year at the General Assembly in New York on the issue of sand and dust storms. And there've been, I think, three Secretary General's reports on um, combating sand and dust storms and there will be another report this year and another resolution this year. So it's a topic that's uh, uh, gained considerable momentum in recent years and things in the UN take time to get uh, uh, momentum going but I think it's up and running now as a, a serious issue in the UN system and of course in the member states um, that make up the United Nations. Uh, publication of this report is timely for two reasons, because there are two UN decades about to begin. There's the UN Decade for Ocean Science for Sustainable Development and the United Nations Decade on Ecosystem Restoration, both of which commence uh, uh, this year. And um, ecosystem rest uh, restoration is, of course, related because uh, some of the uh, sand and dust storm sources on land um, are ecosystems that have been degraded and uh, are ripe for restoration. So that's uh, why the UN has been uh, become interested in sand and dust storms. Uh, let's get to the topic. This is a map that will be familiar to many of you. The global sources of desert dust and long distance transport pathways. And I'm sure many of you are aware that the major area of dust generation is in the so-called dust belt which stretches from west africa uh, through the middle east and northeast asia with lesser um, uh, uh, sources in australasia southern africa uh, south america north america and then also in high latitude areas such as alaska and um, uh, iceland and the black Arrows are the long distance transport pathways and you can see immediately that uh, much of this material is transported over huge distances out over the oceans. How much of it is deposited in the oceans? Um, uh, this gives you some indication by ocean of the deposition rates. Um, although I have to say it was pretty clear to me at an early stage that uh, data availability is quite a, a pertinent issue when you're uh, looking at dust and the oceans because uh, I mean that there's a, a dearth of data on uh, land but oceans more particularly so and many of these numbers are based on um, few and far between actual measurements uh, plus uh, modeling uh, attempts uh, of, of various um, reliabilities. However I think it's it's fair to say that uh, maximum deposition uh, is occurs in the North Atlantic, the Indian Ocean and the North Pacific. They're the three big ones and globally uh, this number here at the bottom all oceans roughly we're talking about half a billion uh, tons of desert dust, desert mineral dust deposited over the oceans um, each year. These are absolute numbers 
in um, relative terms, dust deposition per unit area is at a maximum in the North Atlantic and the North Pacific. And in terms of um, material transported from the land to the sea, um, uh, in global terms, dust input to the oceans is about a tenth of the mass delivered by rivers. But this huge regional variation, um, the dust flux is greater than the fluvial flux um, from North Africa and the Middle East. Uh, in Australia, it's roughly um, equal, but uh, there's very little uh, soil dust, mineral dust that comes out of Europe, for example. Uh, I think a, another pertinent general point to make is that the atmospheric input uh, tends to be on a large spatial scale. And you can see here from this satellite image of um, the northern part of the Indian Ocean, the large area of um, uh, dust being deposited over that air, uh, over that part of the ocean. And in contrast to riverine input, which tends to be much more uh, localized uh, along coasts. That's not to say that you don't also get um, plumes of dust. If I go back a couple of slides, this is Southern Africa and you can see uh, distinct uh, linear plumes coming off uh, the Southern African continent. But at the same time, you also get these very large areas of uh, deposition over the oceans. And the patterns of deposition in the important parts of the global ocean uh, have been patterns that are recognized in ocean uh, sediments uh, over lengthy periods. So top left, we've got a classic satellite image of dust coming off the Sahara Desert into the North Atlantic. Uh, and similar lobe-shaped um, sediment, iron-rich sediments um, in the North Atlantic, uh, both in the contemporary era, era uh, uh, on the, the A map. And this, the, uh, the second map is the last glacial maximum, so 18, 20,000 years ago. So the pattern of deposition has been very similar uh, in recent geological history. Uh, the actual nature of the material, um, dust here in this column uh, for a, a number of uh, metals, you see that dust is the major uh, atmospheric um, source of aluminium, uh, titanium, uh, manganese, iron. Iron's the big one that I'll have quite a lot to say about. Um, and you can see that the dust element is, is um, uh, by far the greatest proportion relative to anthropogenic outputs, uh, natural fires, biogenic sea spray and volcanic uh, inputs of these various metals. And uh, many of these metals are important for biological life because they are also uh, micronutrients. And I think it's fair to say that the nature of the source area dictates uh, the mineralogy and uh, metal and nutrient content of the dust blown out over the oceans. And um, this is well illustrated in this satellite image, uh, image from um, the Libyan coast. You can see two uh, very distinctly different source regions and you can see um, the, the, uh, the color and likely the mineralogy of, of the material blown from those two distinct sources uh, is, is distinctly different. Uh, let's talk about um, primary production because uh, I think it's widely agreed that um, desert dust is a, an extremely important input into many oceans uh, as a source of nutrients. And um, most of the research in this regard has focused on phosphorus, nitrogen and iron. And field observations, experiments various both in laboratories and in situ uh, uh, on the ocean surface, plus numerical modeling efforts have all established links between dust deposition and ocean, ocean chlorophyll concentrations, uh, chlorophyll being a, a, a proxy for um, biological productions, pr production. And uh, by Phytoplankton and phytoplankton, it's uh, important to point out, represent the basis of um, many global food chains. So there are two main ways in which uh, the deposition of nutrients available in desert dust can stimulate the growth of phytoplankton in the oceans. If 
the receiving ecosystem ocean surface is limited by an element that's present in the dust deposited. And this can occur either directly by supplying uh, phosphorus and or iron, which alleviates uh, any limitation by these nutrients, and indirectly if and when uh, dust supplying, again, phosphorus and or iron stimulates the fixation of nitrogen in uh, ecosystems uh, which are limited by uh, uh, nitrogen. Um, oceanographers generally recognize two major types of um, uh, sea surface uh, situation with regard to phytoplankton productivity. One of these is uh, so-called high nutrient low chlorophyll areas, HNLC. So areas of the ocean surface which are high in nutrients, or at least the macronutrients, but anomalously low in chlorophyll. So that just despite having lots of uh, nice macronutrients available, still there's relatively little uh, productivity. And this applies to about 30% of the ocean, uh, open ocean. And it's generally uh, agreed that uh, uh, iron is the main limiting factor. And laboratory and in situ experiments show that um, chlorophyll concentrations in surface waters increase proportionally as you add uh, iron to those waters. And geographically, um, it's uh, northeastern subarctic Pacific, uh, uh, an area of the equatorial Pacific, but perhaps most particularly in the Southern Ocean, uh, where these HNLC areas are particularly prevalent. And we'll say um, more about the Southern Ocean uh, a little late, uh, later. I think it's fair to say that there's also debate on the geographical patterns and the importance of co-limitation beyond, in addition to um, iron, by vitamins and other micronutrients. But as I say, it's generally uh, agreed that um, for these HNLC areas, the limiting factor is iron. And uh, as we saw in the, one of the earlier tables, iron is a, a major constituent of uh, dusts from many deserts. By contrast, there are low nutrient, low chlorophyll areas of the ocean surface, a larger portion, perhaps about 60% of the global ocean, where dust supplies either uh, phosphorus and or iron affect phytoplankton growth both directly and indirectly. And there's evidence for this from um, uh, the Mediterranean, from the Caribbean Sea, uh, the Yellow Sea, and the subtropical uh, North Atlantic gyre, all oligotrophic uh, ecosystems. While those generalizations are fair and generally agreed, I think it's also fair to say that the links between desert dust derived uh, nutrient inputs and marine primary production are not necessarily universal. There's um, some some uh, uh, counter evidence. Uh, and I just highlight um, three lines here. The evidence in Australian waters, for example, is equivocal on the uh, phytoplankton responses to dust deposition. Um, there have been several studies off the uh, coast of West Africa uh, where there have been time lags identified between inputs from uh, Saharan dust storm events and enhanced, enhanced uh, chlorophyll um, in that part of the uh, Atlantic Ocean. And in this study, um, uh, over the period uh, 2000 to 2008, which looked at uh, no fewer than 57 strong dust storm events in that part of the Atlantic, only six events were demonstrated to clearly relate to enhanced phytoplankton growth. So by no means straightforward. And there was a recent pa paper in uh, uh, looking at the equatorial Pacific, uh, this one by Jacobel et al in Nature Geoscience, uh, which uh, throws a big question mark on uh, fertilization in the equatorial Pacific. So, uh, and I think this is a, a, a general comment which is fair to make about many of the links between uh, dust and uh, the oceans is that there's a fair amount of evidence pointing in some directions, but then there's quite a lot of counter evidence and still an awful lot of unanswered questions. In fact, I think uh, if I had to sum up um, the overall 
output from this um, uh, report in one phrase, I'd, I'd say that there are more questions than answers. Now, one of the reasons that the relationship between input of nutrients from desert dust to the ocean surface and ocean productivity is not clear cut uh, revolves around the bioavailability of the elements carried in desert dust. And there's a quote here from uh, Schutz et al. One of the most poorly understood aspects of the entire global dust cycle is this business of the bioavailability of elements. Because most of the phosphorus and iron in desert dust um, are present as minerals that are not immediately soluble in water. And solubility is generally taken as a proxy for bioavailability. So you, you can be putting large amounts of these nutrients into the ocean system, but if they're uh, in a form that's not available uh, to biological life, then it's not going to do much for productivity. But just how these elements become bioavailable is the subject of um, uh, several research efforts. Um, I think it's fair to say that uh, there are good ideas about how this uh, may uh, come about. Um, there are various chemical reactions that may occur around uh, a dust particle in transport. And remember that during long distance transport, dust particles may stay in the atmosphere for, for, for many days on end. Uh, they are subject to solar radiations, which may um, uh, generate chemical reactions on dust particle surfaces uh, just through photochemistry. Uh, they're also um, uh, susceptible to various acids in the atmosphere, sulfuric, nitric acid, um, and organic matter, which also comes with uh, possible uh, acids such as oxalic acid. And the action of these various processes on dust particles during transport is uh, thought to help to change the chemistry and perhaps to uh, make the elements themselves more bioavailable. There's not an awful lot of uh, definitive research in this area, um, but this is one uh, graph which helps to uh, demonstrate some of those relationships. It's um, looking at the acidity and iron solubility for Saharan dust plumes, although I have to say it's, it's not the result of one continuous stream of dust. It's been patched together from, I think, three different um, long-distance transport monitoring networks, one in the Mediterranean and two in different parts of the um, uh, Atlantic. But it generally indicates that um, acidity increases with time um, uh, here up to 25, 30 days. And the solubility, the green line of iron in this case, roughly increasing over that period, but uh, it's highly variable as you can see. Let's move on then. Uh, uh, another aspect of the uh, potential impact of dustborne nutrients in ocean waters um, uh, affecting productivity is, is the potential effect on the growth of algal blooms. And algal blooms are an important food source for marine life. Um, although some also have detrimental effects on human health, and certainly in the in the popular media, it's the the detrimental effects that get more attention: red tides, harmful algal blooms, or HABs. But I think it's important to try and uh, uh, redress that balance of, of uh, sort of slightly scare tactics with the fact that uh, most algal blooms are important for uh, the operation of marine life. But um, uh, the input of desert dust is widely regarded to be an important regulator of many blooms, both uh, harmful or otherwise. Um, although there are other uh, uh, factors at work and nutrient pollution from anthropogenic sources uh, is also probably uh, uh, as important, if not more so, in many cases of harmful algal blooms, many nuisance cases. An extreme example of uh, large algal blooms is the recent increase in sargassum seaweed maps. And you see this um, photograph on the left, which is one of the islands, I think it's um, Barbados, a beach in Barbados, um, uh, which is completely covered uh, by sargassum seaweed mats. It's become an increasing problem, in, uh, particularly in parts of the Caribbean 
but also the Atlantic Ocean uh, coasts of West Africa and uh, Brazil in the last five, six, seven, eight years. Um, uh, these sargassum seaweed maps are again habitat for many open ocean species, but near the shoreline uh, can uh, dis cause all sorts of disruption for human activities, such as tourism. If you wanted to go to this beach, it wouldn't be much fun, uh, uh, and as a hazard to shipping and uh, fishing industries. Now, any relationship between desert dust and uh, sargassum seaweed maps has to be uh, potentially balanced with an awful lot of other potential uh, 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 drivers, like uh, coastal upwelling as a source of nutrients and land-based anthropogenic sources of, uh, of nutrients, and indeed the, the effects of uh, climate change and variability. But desert dust is one of the factors um, uh, which many consider to be uh, relevant in this particular case. Microbial pathogens are another important but um, severely understudied area of uh, uh, desert dust. In the same way that iron that arrives uh, on desert dust um, can generate uh, increased phytoplankton growth, it may also um, be beneficial for certain uh, microbial pathogens in uh, ocean surface waters, which are also kept in check by nutrient limitations. An important one is uh, Vibrio, a bacterium uh, which is common in the ocean um, uh, and has some pathogenic outcomes such as cholera, uh, but um, also diseases for people um, associated with shellfish. And there have been a couple of um, studies of Vibrio uh, and how they respond to iron-rich Saharan dust in the Caribbean. Um, uh, one of the uh, studies by Retrit, uh, Westrich et al. saw a very rapid increase in 24 hours from about 1% of the total microbial community in the sea surface waters to about 20% with an input of iron-rich uh, Saharan dust. And a similar observation in the open ocean of the tropical um, mid-Atlantic. Um, many studies, uh, there aren't that many, but those that are, uh, that have looked at microorganisms in desert dust, demonstrate that there are a great many potential pathogens transported with desert dust, again, over great distances and in a viable state. Um, uh, and these microorganisms that are present in dryland soils are by definition highly resistant to desiccation, to temperature extremes, to high salinity regimes, and indeed to exposure to ultraviolet radiation because of where they come from, i.e. Uh, uh, desert conditions. So they're extremely resilient. And um, uh, both, uh, they live a long time during transport and are still viable uh, many days uh, after arriving on the ocean surface, but also can survive a, a very long time anyway. And some of you may be aware of um, this paper that uh, uh, appeared in Environmental Microbiology um, 10 plus years ago, where some uh, German researchers found some of the samples taken by Charles Darwin on the uh, HMS Beagle uh, in the Atlantic Ocean um, in the 1830s. He sent the samples to a colleague, Ehrenberg, in uh, Berlin for analysis. This is 170 odd years ago. And these um, academics in, in Germany found the samples, which are still in the uh, Museum of Natural History in Berlin, and found that the, the, the microorganisms, or many of them, in these samples, which have been in the, the museum for 170 years, still to be viable uh, 170 years later, which gives you an indication of just how resilient some of these uh, microorganisms are. It's an area that uh, about which we know really relatively little, but um, there's an estimate of a significant fraction, maybe 20, 30 percent, of what is a very diverse population of microorganisms in desert dust are species capable of causing diseases in both uh, marine and terrestrial organisms, albeit that there's actually very little data on specific microbes. So it's an area of research um, which is ripe uh, uh, to, to be undertaken and, and uh, about which we know uh, very little. Another 
facet of this um, uh, uh, of this aspect of desert dust and um, uh, microbial pathogens is interreactions between microbes which are available on uh, desert dust uh, particles and how they also interact and synergize with toxins of human origin, so uh, various pollutants which are also in the atmosphere, and how they may affect um, ecosystems uh, where the material is deposited. Dust and coral reef systems. There are um, uh, uh, again, we're still talking about microorganisms carried in des desert dust, and there was a spurt of research in the um, late 1970s, early uh, uh, 1980s, and up until um, the turn of uh, the century, on um, the effects on coral reef systems, in particular in in the Caribbean. Uh, or at least it started in the Caribbean, and I'll explain why in a minute. Um, and then uh, the same ideas were were um, taken to look at coral reefs elsewhere. But there are at least four um, diseases known to affect coral reefs which have an association with desert dust. Um, perhaps the, the strongest association is with sea fan disease, uh, and that's what the, this picture here illustrates, a sea fan coral which has been infected and these purple lesions um, that you see on the sea fan coral are evidence of that effect, infection. Um, uh, and it's caused by a fungus, which is widely found in desert soils, also happens to be salt tolerant and capable of growing in the sea. Um, there's also a, a disease known as black band disease, which also has a relationship with desert dust and is dependent at least in part on the iron content of the dust, um, which helps its pathogenicity. Uh, white plague or white syndrome also has suspected links to iron rich dust and white pox um, is a, a, another disease which um, has links with desert dust and uh, coral reefs. Um, much of this research started in the Caribbean and I'm sure it's no coincidence that, well, firstly, that it was in the 1970s that um, it was first realized that coral reefs were susceptible to disease. Uh, a lot of the research was um, undertaken, that early research was undertaken in the Caribbean. And as it happens, the, <clears throat> the 1970s and 80s, early 80s anyway, were peak years for transport of Saharan dust to the Caribbean. And there was a classic paper by uh, Shin and colleagues in 2000, which included a version of um, uh, this graph and relating peaks of um, dust concentrations measured uh, at Barbados, uh, which are the bars, to outbreaks of various um, uh, coral diseases in the Caribbean. I think, however, it, it's, it's fair to say that um, there's still a lot of progress to be made on links between both diseases and coral reefs and the uh, importance or otherwise of um, desert dust, because there's still a limited understanding of uh, of those diseases that affect uh, coral, uh, their caus causative agents and, and how the uh, pathogens work. And I think it's probably fair to say that dust uh, Deposition is, deposition is one of the drivers uh, and it may work in non-obvious ways. Um, it may also, in combination with nutrient enrichment, uh, SST anomalies, sea surface temperature anomalies, and other anthropogenic pollutants, uh, the way it may affect coral reefs is to undermine their resilience to disturbance by such diseases. But um, I, I think it's fair to say that there's still a lot to learn about this relationship between dust and coral reefs. Let's move on to um, dust and global climate. And the focus here will be very largely on the biological carbon pump. So it's another facet of fertilization of the ocean surface. Um, uh, and the biological carbon pump is depicted in, in this diagram here. Um, and uh, which attempts to break up uh, dust dip deposition effects um, uh, uh, on the stocks of carbon in the ocean, which are the green boxes, and uh, the fluxes of carbon, which are the blue boxes. 
So uh, you deposit dust on the ocean surface, uh, it delivers micronutrients, iron being uh, perhaps the most important one. And if you uh, fertilize um, all these small creatures, phytoplankton tend to, because they go through, uh, create primary production, they draw down CO2 from the atmosphere. But at the same time, you may also be fertilizing uh, certain types of bacteria, which uh, on balance respire more than is taken in. However, in these highly fertilized parts of the ocean surface, there's a net primary production which means that you're drawing more carbon down into the ocean, sequestering it um, uh, through marine snow, so debris and uh, uh, small creatures and larger creatures, um, defecating, crapping, getting rid of their carbon, which uh, um, uh, slowly falls to the uh, bottom of the oceans, uh, uh, oceanic creatures dying and their skeletons equally falling to the bottom and eventually you get carbon storage and sedimentation which um, uh, uh, if you wait long enough may become rocks and you lock the carbon up. And this idea of um, fertilization with iron, um, I've also put this uh, uh, photograph of uh, a German research vessel because it's the, this idea which um, there's a lot of evidence to support it has also generated some uh, one of the perhaps arguably the most viable geoengineering so-called solution to uh, global climate change. And this uh, ship uh, was uh, on a research expedition in the in 2004 where they actually deliberately fertilized parts of the Southern Ocean with iron filings to try and um, uh, simulate this um, uh, biological carbon pump as a way of proving that some of these geoengineering or this particular geoengineering so-called answer to global climate change might work. It's a whole different issue. Uh, uh, it's not actually covered in the report, but I'll just mention it in passing for obvious reasons. Now, dust in the Southern Ocean um, uh, is particularly important because there's quite a lot of evidence to suggest that this biological carbon pump was more efficient uh, during glacial periods of the Quaternary last couple of million years or so um, uh, uh, on uh, of planet's history. There's a hypothesis supported by both ice core and marine sediment core evidence that high atmospheric concentrations of iron rich dust deposited in the oceans during glacials enhanced phytoplankton growth, i.e. had this fertilizing effect, and had a net effect of lowering uh, uh, atmospheric CO2 uh, during um, glacial periods by perhaps 10 or 20 parts per million. So quite a, a significant effect. And this effect was uh, 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 perhaps most pronounced in these high nutrient, low chlorophyll areas, and particularly so in the Southern Ocean, where we know productivity is, is limited, uh, most importantly, by um, a deficiency in iron. This isn't to say that um, this idea is not debatable. Um, there's evidence both ways. I mean, the, a major problem with this idea of the enhanced uh, biological carbon pump during glacial periods and enhancement in the Southern Hemisphere, Southern Oceans, is that today, there aren't any major continental dust sources in the Southern Hemisphere at all, which rather puts a, a, a question mark over the whole idea. However, um, there's contrary evidence because um, glaciers generally are marked by increased dust deposition to the oceans. And we know this from uh, various ocean uh, sediment cores. Um, but in uh, uh, the South Atlantic from South American dust sources, uh, there's this paper from Lambert et al, which suggested actually that dust, dust, dust deposition may have been up to 25 times, uh, delivering 25 times more dust during glacial periods. So although today perhaps we have no major dust sources, although there's some in, in Patagonia in South America, if those sources that are, we can still see today were much more effective at delivering sediment to the oceans, then perhaps it uh, lends further credence to this idea of the importance of the Southern Ocean uh, uh, as a source of the biological carbon pump. 
And the other bit of evidence in that regard um, comes from high latitude glacial sources. I, I, for a long time, I've been interested in, in, in desert dust for 30 plus years. And it's only really in the last 10, 12, maybe 15 years that uh, high latitude sources of de desert dust have come to be recognized as in the same sort of ballpark as the hot deserts, the low latitude deserts. And one interesting aspect of high latitude glacial sources of desert dust is that they do tend to have elevated levels of bioavailable bio iron. So again, that's a, another counter argument, perhaps supporting this idea that um, during glacial, uh, interglacial cycles, the Southern Ocean uh, was an area of, of, of particularly effective uh, biological carbon pump. Uh, I'm going to end then on the recommendations um, from this report. I won't go through them all. Many of them highlight the fact that um, there are several areas of research linking desert dust to the oceans about which we know woefully little. Um, there's certainly a big argument in favour of establishing a network of uh, study sites in different oceans for long-term measurements in the marine atmospheric boundary level, layer and in uh, on the ocean surface. Now we all know that uh, long-term monitoring networks aren't sexy and don't get funding but that's not to say they're not important, they are and as I said before um, uh, one of the glaring points about uh, our understanding of desert dusts and the oceans is the lack of measurements um, for obvious reasons because uh, um, studies in the open ocean are, are difficult um, but nonetheless there's a very real need for um, uh, long-term measurements and, and monitoring in those parts of the Earth's system. Uh, encouragement for development of uh, dust cycle models uh, at various scales and simulation of emission transport and deposition. Um, some of the recommendations relate to um, uh, land sources. I mean this one at the top here, we don't know enough about uh, natural sources and sources of desert dust which are the result of anthropogenic uh, mismanagement and linking it to ecosystem restoration and projects such as Africa's uh, Great Green Wall. These sorts of projects uh, can help mitigate dust sources. Um, as always, you have to be a, rather careful between highlighting problems that face human society related to desert dust like perhaps uh, Vibrio bacteria and uh, the uh, spread of cholera and gastroenteritis type problems with uh, uh, microbial pathogens. And the simple fact that the movement of desert dust around the planet, which has been going on for a very long time, as we know from um, uh, uh, marine sediment cores, is part of how the Earth system works. And therefore, we have to be a bit careful about um, trying to uh, mess about with that system. Um, there's uh, so the encouragement of research into interactions between dust deposited in oceans and impacts on human health. Um, and also, uh, I highlight this one, number nine, promote the assessments of the economic of any damage caused by sand and dust storms, because there's a woeful absence of uh, these sort of economic assessments, both on land as well as at, uh, uh, in the oceans. Uh, and money is what policymakers understand best uh, for obvious reasons, and um, trying to put economic value on any potential damage, or indeed ecosystem services, um, can only enhance uh, the development and policy uh, uh, for uh, mitigation efforts. And there's uh, uh, also a recommendation on enhancing the, the science policy interface, the way in which uh, science can inform policy uh, and related to uh, the SDGs, both um, uh, life below water, life on land uh, uh, and several others. And on that note, I think I'll come to an end and leave you um, with the download. Uh, if you're interested in this report, it's available as a download. And this is the address to get it from. It's um, 
rather lengthy, but if you put impacts of sand and dust storms on oceans into a search engine, you'd get there in the same way. Okay, thank you very much for listening. Thank you very much. Um, yeah, thank you very much for the presentation. Someone, yes. Uh, yes, Sarah. Thank you so much. Uh, just, uh, I would like to invite uh, Dan Beret Stup, that is in the audience today, and he's a really expert in the position measurement on the ocean. If you want to speak, just raise the the hand in your in your chat. If not, uh, because there is a clear point about the lack of observations on the oceans and the establishment of a network. I don't know if he can, ah, he wants to talk. Cool. I will give you, uh, now, uh, now you can talk. Nope, yeah. Does it work, can you hear me? Yes. Yes. Yeah. All right, thanks uh, Nick for an uh, interesting talk. <clears throat> and I've, I think I've seen your uh, report. I think I've even uh, commented on it. And uh, it gives a nice overview of, uh, <clears throat> of the state of the art, although I think we have a bit further already with the, uh, the influence of wet deposition on the ocean, especially in the <clears throat> information of droplet formation. There could be all kinds of processes that are already making the iron uh, bioavailable. So I think that's something to go for. And that's definitely I'm going to uh, dive into in the next years, uh, provided I get funding. But uh, yeah, so far you said it's not sexy to uh, to do monitoring, but uh, somehow we've uh, been able to uh, get some money to continue our our uh, monitoring series of uh, buoys and uh, um, submarine sediment traps of the uh, Mauritanian coast. So that's good. We at least have two more uh, <clears throat> ship expeditions, so two more years of monitoring, and um, we're hoping to uh, get some nice results from those data. Uh, yeah, I think uh, you've touched on, on most of the uh, important uh, aspects of uh, the relationships between uh, dust and marine life. So uh, well done. Maybe you could comment on the, on the expedition by uh, George Russ in 2012. I'm not sure if you're aware of his dumping uh, 1,200 uh, tons of uh, iron sulfide <clears throat> into the Pacific. Yeah, yes, I am aware of it. Um, I, I think you're either with them or against them. I, I personally am against them because um, these ideas of the, the the gross experimentation of any sort with the Earth system um, is rather dangerous because you're tinkering with uh, fundamentals of the way the planet works on a rather large scale at that. And although some outcomes of fertilization of the ocean surface may be predictable, uh, uh, but my bottom dollar, there are an awful lot of other outcomes which are rather less predictable. So I, I personally am not particularly in favour of these large-scale geoengineering uh, experiments. Yeah, I me mean, neither. Obviously, <clears throat> I think it's uh, it's very dangerous even because you can can count on that if you mess the system in one side, that you will get unwanted and uh, unexpected results on other parts of the ocean in terms of nutrient distributions. Yeah, and also the uh, the microbial part is very interesting. Uh, <clears throat> I'm not so sure how uh, clean the uh, sampling of uh, Charles Darling uh, was uh, some 150 years ago, but uh, we've been trying to do the same and um, we managed to find some microbes uh, in, in the dust as well. And, uh, but this is a whole new field because we have no idea what, what bugs they are and, and what they do, what their functioning is. No, yeah, I, I, I agree with you there. I think it is one of one of those fields which is wide open and there's a, an awful lot more to find out. I suspect Charles Darwin's sampling procedures weren't perhaps as um, pristine as they are today, but it's, um, it was a very interesting paper to see the fact that um, some of it, the microbes that he uh, gathered 170, 180 years ago uh, are still viable. Yeah, that's amazing, isn't it? Well, what I also found amazing that he uh, recognized actually, or maybe it was his colleague uh, Ehrenberg in, uh, in Berlin, who recognized the freshwater diatoms in the dust. So already by then they recognized that this must be uh, 
must be um, uh, lake floors, lake deposits blown out across the uh, the ocean. Yes, indeed, humbling. In 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 many regards, they they um they had some of the answers an awful long time ago. Yeah. The the earliest record I found, I think, is uh, by, by, by. Okay, please go ahead. Yeah. No, 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 go, go. Well, just an anecdotal note. The earliest record I found of uh, of dust from Sahara blowing uh, towards the ocean is uh, some hundred years before uh, Darwin, uh, or maybe, yes, yeah, so now maybe a little bit less, 1780s, where um, uh, Matthew Dobson studied uh, the Harmattan uh, wind system, and he noticed that uh, that there was a kind of haze in the air, and that the sun was obscured and things like that. And he even uh, sensed uh, the, the impact of dust particles on his skin, but didn't recognize it was dust. So that's a very uh, interesting uh, quotes as well. I think it's the oldest record of dust, uh, oldest publication I found. Yeah, there's also a, 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 an 18th century French paper also at sea, I seem to remember. Can't remember for the moment um, the name of the guy. Sarah. I could go on for you. hours, uh, Sarah, so please <laughs> go ahead. Hi. Yeah. Okay, uh, we have a couple of questions, Australians, if you want to to start, or I can see we have a couple of questions for you. Uh, how much is there? Okay, uh, Hussein Panaifar, I think that is from Iran, uh, is talking, is asking you, when you talk about dust impacts on oceans, how much is the ratio of dust which is suspended on the air over the ocean? So say again, Sarah, I didn't get that. How much of what? Yeah, I cannot fully understand. How much is the ratio of dust which is suspended on, on, on the air over the ocean? I think that he is asking something like, what is the ratio between the flux of dust in the air and then what is uh, transport the posite on the water part? I, I think well the estimates of the amount of um, uh, desert mineral dust produced from Earth's surface is around about two million two billion tons a year, and uh, roughly twenty five percent of that ends up in the oceans. Then 70% is still suspended in the air, right? Well, yeah, or, or deposited on, on land. Okay, this is a... Because what goes up always okay. eventually comes down. So anything that gets suspended in the atmosphere will be deposited at some stage. And as far as we can uh, guesstimate, about 25% of the material that goes into the atmosphere ends up in the oceans. and the rest ends up on terrestrial ecosystems. I think that the question is answered. Yeah, 20, 25% we're saying, yeah. Yeah. Thank you. There is another yeah, like. Do you want to yes, add? there is another like a comment from Patricia Lopez. Uh, she's mentioning that uh, the variation of phosphorus and uh, iron and uh, has to be measured maybe in the water and relate to with biology. And then uh, observation in remote islands, I think, could be beneficial in this kind of aspects. However, I guess this is not uh, so easy. So, quite quite a lot of the uh, monitoring data has has been undertaken on islands in the Caribbean, for example, like that. The, the graph I showed from um, the Shin et al. paper um, was dust deposition monitoring in Barbados, which is a very long record. Okay. Um, and there is a reference from Jambaret about the amount of the that is you had done. 
that is around 140 megatons of Atlantic Ocean. Uh, this is just a reference for the rest of the audience. And Patricia Lopez is asking if there is any long-term series at the uh, at Gran Cana in Canary Islands too. If you know if there is any long-term uh, records of of observations close to Canary Islands, not Barbados. I don't know the answer to that, Sarah. You'd know better than than I, because they're Spanish, aren't they? I mean, the, the Observatory of Isania in Tenerife is having the longest long-term record of, of suspended dust, but not deposited, I would say. They have some samples, but the series is shorter than the EM, for example. But you can contact Patricia, the people from the Observatorio Meteorológico de Isania, uh, that is uh, the director is Emilio Cuevas, uh, and they can give you this, this information. Okay, there are some, let's say, last there minute are... <laughs> questions, but... Uh... Uh, yeah. <laughs> Is there any study which shows the influence of that size on oceans, microbial and algal blooms? Uh, are there any studies? Yes, this is the question that shows the influence of that size on oceans. A particle size. Yeah, there, there's mention of the the relative importance of particle size um, in some of the studies of um, the importance of iron that I remember, um, and also the previous um, speaker who you invited, Sarah. I can't think what the guy's name is. The Dutch guy who who was talking just now. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, Jan Berend. Uh, uh, Jan, that's Jan right. I, I, I'm sure he he would have something to say on particle size because I uh, uh, remember one of his talks um, was well. Next, the next talk in this series is about so-called giant dust particles, and that's a whole other kettle of fish that we know relatively little about, but so-called giant particles, uh, dust particles, i.e. sand-sized particles in excess of 62 and a half microns, um, are often transported huge distances. Uh, and many of the monitoring networks aren't designed to catch these large, th large particles, which is why they've sort of gone undetected for a long time. And, and also many of our um, models for understanding long distance transport suggest these giant particles shouldn't be transported great distances, and yet they are. Um, so actually the, the whole large particle uh, conundrum is a, a, a very interesting aspect. And as I say, I, I think, isn't that the subject of the next talk in this series, Sarah? Pardon? More or less, yes. Pardon. Yes. Yeah. I, I was really in, I was reading the questions box because yes, now yes. they start to raise many questions. The, the next. And, uh, yes, the next speaker, uh, Claire Ryder, would speak about the giant particles. So, yeah, yeah. There is a question, In fact, uh, uh, yeah, we will announce we will announce the next webinar at the end of today. And uh, there is a question. Yeah, from Sandra, Marco they start to raise all the questions. Yeah, go ahead, Stelio. Yeah, so we have some. Uh, the question is probably about, it's for Sarah, what about dust emission and transport in the future? Are climate models improving the representation of dust processes? It's for you, this question. It's a small question. No, it's not exactly for me because I'm not climate <laughs> modeler, but there is here in the audience a couple of members of BSC that are working in this topic. And yes, there is some efforts to improve the dust representation, basically, the, one of the works that are been doing here at the department is the inclusion of the mineralogy in the ECRs model, for example, just to improve the characterization of the radiative forcing, but also 
the uh, the the nutrients that are deposited in on the oceans, like the island and the phosphorus. Uh, Elisa, that is here in the audience, is, is doing a PhD, in fact, in this topic, together with Carlos Perez and Maria Gonzalez. And maybe we can organize a webinar because <laughs> this is another totally different topic, how we can improve the representation of dust. And there are different projects ongoing now, like that is also searching to improve the representation of dust in the climate models because there are there are many things to improve not just the part of the mineralogy also the coupling with the vegetation models that are quite important for the correct representation of the trends for future based on the degradation of the land and things like that then there are many many ongoing things i have to say maybe you can think to organize a meeting about it a webinar uh, Maybe last question, uh, because it's four o'clock. The last, yeah, because... <laughs> and maybe this has to be from people uh, that, uh, that ask uh, about Arabian dust and dust from Iran, because most of the presentation was about uh, Saharan dust in the Atlantic. So people are asking about uh, spe specific suggestions about ground-based sampling on dust in these areas. And also, if you have to comment something different uh, for these uh, dust sources. Yeah, there's a huge amount of research on dust coming out of uh, Iran. And um, with regard to marine ecosystems, there are some studies in uh, the Persian Gulf and the Northern Arabian Sea on, uh, that I can think of relating, looking at the, the, the uh, fertilization effect of desert dust on uh, um, the ocean surface. And again, the uh, evidence is equivocal. Um, uh, some of it finds a, a relationship. Sometimes there are time lags involved. I remember one paper that looked at the nutrients and decided that actually the nutrients um, uh, sank to the bottom of the, uh, I think it was the, the Persian Gulf, uh, and then got resuspended within the water. Um, so the conclusion of that one was that yes, uh, desert dust is important for fertilization, but it's not as it hits the ocean surface, it goes to the, sinks to the seabed and then gets resuspended. So um, yes, it is a, a, a another active area of dust research, both um, on land and um, uh, some of it over the oceans. Okay. Sarah, we uh, don't hear you. Any question okay. that you will have for Nick, because we have to close okay. the webinar is for... I will switch off the camera just in case. Uh, no, you can hear me, I hope, right? I can hear you, yes, yeah. that's better. You can hear me? Yeah. Yes. Uh, just, I want to remember to the participants that you can send your questions. We will pass to Nick. And also we have your emails, but also I think that Nick will be very happy to answer your emails directly if you send him. And just the last thing is to remember you uh, uh, or next webinar. I will try to share my screen without no problem. I hope that you can see he, see something now. I don't know what you're watching, but our yes, next yes. webinar is in charge of Claire Reid Ryder from the University of Reading. It will be at the end of this month in, 20, in two weeks from now at 3 Central European time at 2 UTC. And Please, you don't hesitate to, to do the registration through the INDAS website. Uh, we are not putting here the link because we, maybe we will change the, the system for the webinars, but it will be for the next uh, session. But in any case, all the people that is already registered uh, will, will receive an update if we will change the platform, okay? Then no worries. And with it, Estelius. Yes, thank you very session. much.
and uh, looking forward to see you in two weeks. Have a nice afternoon and thanks a lot, Nick, for the talk. Thank you very much, Nick. Bye-bye. Bye, guys. Thank you.